Here we go. Okay. So we are at the uh, University of Alberta. I'm about to uh, interview Mr. Eric Newell. And um, we'll start with a few just opening questions. So could you please state your full name and age, please? Yeah. Uh, my name is Eric Patrick Newell, uh, and uh, I'm 70 years old. I was born December 16th, 1944. And where were you born? I was born uh, in Kamloops, British Columbia. It was during the Second World War, and uh, but I grew up in uh, Victoria, British Columbia, and uh, went to the University of British Columbia for my engineering degree. Okay. And uh, actually, you said you grew up during the Second World War. Do you Are there any moments you remember? No, I was no. only one year old. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah, and my dad, my dad was uh, was stationed in Kamloops, and that's why I was born there. But uh, okay. I re we returned to Victoria one year later when I was one year old. So beautiful city, eh? Yeah, I've, I've never been to BC yet. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, I always kid my friends in Ottawa. It's uh, it's like Ottawa, but with good weather. <laughs> no snow. No snow. Or minus forty. Yeah, right. Yeah, this yeah. winter was brutal. Yeah, he had a cold winter. Yeah. So, as a as a child, what did your parents do? My father was a banker uh, with the Royal Bank of Canada for forty five years, and, um, but my mother and my mother stayed at home, and she raised the three children, uh, my two sisters and myself. And um, did you ever, as a child, have an early passion or show an early passion for um, the eventual field you you would get into? So not really. Sure. No, my be, probably because of my father being in the, a banker and that. I always thought I I was trying to decide whether I wanted to be a chartered accountant or a corporate lawyer. And uh, and I had fortunately I had a an American uncle, Uncle George, who was an electrical engineer, and he. Uh, asked me what uh, what's, what subjects was I interested in, and I answered it wrong. I said, well, I can't make up my mind whether I want to be a chartered accountant or a lawyer, and he, he said, I didn't ask you that. He said, I asked you what subjects do you like, and I talked about math and science, and of course I wanted to go in business, uh, my own and that. And he says, well, you don't have a choice. I said, geez, Uncle George, which one is it? Corporate law or chartered accountants? He said, neither one. Says it's engineering, <laughs> and and he explained how he taught a engineering course. He was a consultant engineer, but he taught a course at University of Washington, and they followed his class ten years later, and uh, all the different fields they got into, and uh, and he said that he says you shouldn't shouldn't pick a don't try to pick a profession, pick what you're interested in, and it's like you picking history over engineering. It's a great choice, you. Yeah. And so uh, it was sort of a little bit by good luck, and I ended up going into engineering, chemical engineering, and uh, in BC. Yeah, BC. So, so that was in was it in high school when your uncle kind of? Yeah, I was just uh, just finishing grade twelve, and uh, and the way it worked in uh, in British Columbia at the time, you you couldn't go directly into engineering. You had to do one year of art, general arts and science, and then then four year engineering course. It was a five year program in BC. I guess that's when you think about it, though. It's uh, it's probably good. I mean, it helps a lot of probably no. confused uh, young adults. I mean, just like uh, Quebec has Cégep. Yeah, exactly. It gives you yeah, kind of a year to to. to yeah, um, it's a big help that like. way. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's also why I'm a big fan of uh, co-op programs too, where young people get to go out in the workplace and kick the tire, so to speak, and uh, test drive different careers, and because it's all about finding out what you're passionate about. For sure. And um, when you finally made it to university, you started directly into chemical engineering? Yeah, yeah. We, again, you took one year of yep. general engineering, and then, uh, so that would have been second year university, and then you, you made a decision in second year, and I chose chemical. And uh, But it was interesting, I graduated, and the only decision I made uh, was I'd never work in the oil and gas industry. <laughs> <laughs> so again, I wanted to either work in pulp and paper or or chemicals, and so my first job was in Georgia Pacific in Bellingham, Washington. It was a, a, a pulp and paper plant, plant with a, with a chemicals division, and they were a great employer. But I got a fellowship to go to Britain, the, um, the uh, Athlone Fellowship, to, which enabled me to go over to Britain. I did my master's at the University of Birmingham. In the, in the same. Uh, well, same well there I did it in. It was sort of like a. a somewhere between an industrial engineering and an MBA. It was a business school, but they, the Brits, uh, British government had 
put this program to place in place because they wanted to uh, enhance uh, Britain's competitiveness and they the the Athlone Fellowship was designed just for Canadian engineers and and they wanted people who they deemed would uh, uh, rise and at some point uh, remember their experience in Britain they would buy British so they were not looking just for marks they wanted to see student leadership and of course I'd been president of our fraternity and I was president of all the engineers at UBC and I was very active on the big student council so I had that kind of broader interest that appealed to them. So I did my master's there, it was uh, one year and then I worked a year and a half in London uh, uh, for a consulting firm, Creamer Warner. My boss uh, was knighted for his work, Sir Frederick Warner. We uh, were the consultants that uh, led the program that cleaned up the River Thames. It was a 15 year project and I was there in 1969 and that was the first year that the fish came all the way down the river. So it was pretty exciting. and. That's where I started to get interested in uh, in other areas and traditional, what a traditionally a chemical engineer would look at, it was sort of in, interested in pulp paper and chemicals. And, and so I, Sir Frederick tried to get me interested in the environmental area, which he did, uh, but at the same time I had some friends uh, uh, that I met who were working with Imperial, Imperial Oil, um, had decided they were gonna computerize all the refineries across Canada and they were looking to form a group because this was new field. And those, the kids today would laugh, William, at it because you got more power in your BlackBerry than you had in the computers in those days. But, uh, but it was a new area and it was, and so three of us, uh, Cam McAlpine, Bron Brenneman, who ultimately became CEO of Petra Canada, and myself, uh, uh, we, we were hired out of Britain to come to Imperial Oil and, uh, the three of us and one or two others, we were signed and we went and spent the next seven years going across the country computerizing, uh, putting process control computers in the uh, Imperial Oil uh, uh, refinery. So it was uh, it was a fascinating, fascinating experience. Uh, Did you guys know anything about uh, computers and programming? Well, we were learning and uh, but we so probably the advantage was we knew more than our supervisors. So. Most jobs you get, you know, you work six or eight years and you aspire to replace your supervisor. Well, none of them had done it, so we had to do every, all the aspects of it, like right from the beginning of talking to the refinery, finding out what they would want a computer for, specifying the function, going out for contract. Uh, I relocated, I lived out of my car for seven years. I uh, spent, uh, one of the nice assignments was, uh, I met my wife along the way in New Jersey. We got married oh, and, uh, uh, Jersey girl, yeah, and uh, and then I I worked initially on our Dartmouth refinery on the East Coast, and then I worked on the Montreal refinery, and in that job, uh, I was sent to San Diego. We lived two years in San Diego and designed right from the f ground up a brand new uh, c computer uh, scheme for controlling all the oil movements and gasoline blending and all of that, and then would have to follow up and install the computer, do all the training of the operators. It was Tremendous experience, and uh, I can't imagine how many mistakes we must have made, but none, no one knew. <laughs> so consequently, we were always taking on more and more responsibility, and uh, and uh, and and of course, uh, uh, if you handle that well, then uh, the opportunities come your way. And so it was. Uh, I was always treated extremely well by Imperial Oil, and I had an exciting career with them, but. Uh, uh, the best thing that ever happened to me was when I got sent to Sinkrude in 1986. So would you say, uh, we'll get to Sinkrude, absolutely, but would you say um, your job with Imperial Oil was your first official um, job or first official uh, yeah, yeah. Of your profession? Yeah, I, it really was Imperial Oil, but I, would, I think of it that way, even though I'd spent the, initially uh, my first employer was Georgia Pacific and I had some other uh, companies I worked in uh, in the summers, you know, but uh, uh, the Georgia Pacific one was only four months before I went off onto the fellowship. So, and then I had the job with the consulting firm in England. That was just for a year and a half. So the first sort of what I would call longer term commitment turned out to be uh, Imperial Oil. And but when I joined there, I I started to get this view. I was traveling a lot, and I was young, and I was single, and I. Uh, enjoyed it, so I, I really didn't think uh, of, I was signing up to work my life with one company. I, 
And it was funny, one, I can remember tell, uh, in the meantime, I, I, I went back to Sarnia, I started in Sarnia, Ontario at the end of 1969, and, uh, and I was doing the Dartmouth, I was assigned the Dartmouth refinery, and they uh, had a, a research and development project within Exxon, and Imperial is, uh, is owned 69 uh, plus percent by Exxon, and so I was loaned to Exxon in New Jersey to develop a mini computer system for our Dartmouth refinery as a research project. And uh, that's where I met my wife, and uh, and uh, so I, uh, I uh, so I was uh, I was getting really interesting work, and I can remember waking up one day and saying, "I've been now with this company for five years, and I wasn't even thinking of leaving." And so, and so I switched, and then I you know I started to think more in the, in terms of this is a long term career, but um, you know. Um, Imperial oil and a lot of the industry, the mining industry, and that is, uh, if you, if, if you're willing to be flexible and you're willing to move and live in different places, uh, it offered uh, great career opportunities for young people like myself, and uh, and uh, so we took advantage of it. And as I said, we ended up in San Diego for a couple of years, and then in Montreal, and then I finally came back to Toronto, and uh, you know, I think it was 19. Uh, 76 and uh, it was the first time I'd ever been in the head office and here I'd worked for the company for seven years and and I made a fundamental shift I uh, I actually requested uh, them to change my career path and I wanted to get more into the strategic and business planning side and so they put me into a corporate planning group which was a small on-call service group to the board for people they deemed to have high potential and uh, and that opened up some more paths and I then went into uh, more of the uh, planning and uh, strategy development for the, again, the refining side of the business, not the upstream. Uh, and uh, until it was time I became, uh, in 1980, 79, 80, around that time frame, around the Iranian oil crisis, I got the, uh, my first really big promotion. I became product supply manager for all of Canada. Big for uh, Imperial, yes, and we, we were caught in that thing where you're having to buy crude oil, and I, you know, I, I did make mistakes, and I, you know, if people remember back to 1981, uh, things like the uh, economy, suddenly the recession came in, uh, uh, suddenly, um, uh, you know, the Iranian crisis was on, and, the, you know, people were learning to live with, you know, lower amounts of energy, so energy demand was falling off, the national energy program was brought in by Pierre Trudeau, the Prime Minister, and everything conspired, and all of a sudden demand fell off the thing, but because we were so concerned about where crude oil was coming from, we used to actually have the buy the crude right out of my office in Toronto, because you had to make decisions quick. Well, I got I got trapped with a million barrels of crude oil on the on ships out in the ocean, and uh, and uh, we had to work it off. So I, I didn't make every decision right now. I always respected uh, uh, the senior uh, imperial oil manager because this was, a, this was a type of a job which should do occur in a few industries where you have to make big decisions, you have to make them quick, and you can't be right all the time. You better not be wrong too many times, <laughs> but, and I, but I was wrong and they, they stuck by me and we worked it off. And then from there they decided, uh, uh, because in our industry, and, and I mean our industry, I mean all the mining and everything, we we truly understand in our hearts the importance of safety and uh, and operations. And uh, you know, uh, what, one of my bosses said, "Well, it's time for you to now you're you're getting ready to move up even higher in the organization. It's time for you to get uh, understand things that are really important. They are called safety glasses, hard hats, and safety shoes." <laughs> And uh, but uh, he, he he sent me out to uh, Vancouver to run. Uh, it, we used to joke at Imperial it was a refinery run by kids because I was when I became refinery manager or I couldn't have been more than thirty five or thirty six years old, and that was a big responsibility. But I, Bill Keel was my first uh, boss, the vice president. He was man of few words, and he brought me up in the office, and uh, he he all he said to me, he says. Uh, you're going to be running an explosives factory. Act accordingly. 
And I've never forgotten that. It's all Bill said. No pressure. No, well, I, I, if you ever want to know why, why safety is important to us, uh, you know, that gets uh, brings it home. And then we have, you know, as you operate uh, large uh, things, and it would be interesting to hear old mine managers talk about some of the things that they, uh, you know, near disasters or disasters they have to uh, have to live through in there. Uh, time you uh, you learn you learn about the importance of operation and uh, and the importance of safety and and key issues like that which you know sometimes people tend to poo poo but believe me they're at the heart of our industry and they always have been they always will be uh, from there I was lucky I, I uh, it was a tough time uh, we were uh, uh, the refinery I was running was a smaller one we actually um, I had entertained a, a plan that was considering shutting it down and I, I had a new boss and I asked him, I said, this was totally counter to what a lot of companies did. I said, this is a huge decision. I, I want to involve the employees, my employees in it and, uh, and I'm not trying to scare them but I just want to involve them because, in uh, you know, we should have some say in our destiny. It was one of the most interesting experiences of our, my life was I worked with the union and uh, first brought in all my supervisors, made sure they were aware, then brought the union, talked to them about what was going on, then went out and talked to all the employees. Uh, and I, you know, I said, look, it's, it's a tough world out there. We, yeah, we could roll up the prayer rug and say, you know, it's, we don't stand a chance because we had these big refineries that were running less than full in Edmonton and a chance to bring product down to the uh, Vancouver market area and the, you know, the, you know, the smaller refineries weren't going to survive. But I said, you know, it's a tough world. We could just give up. But I said, you know, uh, why don't we all pull together and make it the toughest decision Imperial Oil ever made to shut us down. We're going to do everything that was right. And we, uh, without going into all the details, we became a very high-performing uh, refinery. And uh, the economics weren't there. The refinery lasted another 10 years. And and, uh, and you know, uh, people, when I did that to explain to people about the chance of shutting the refinery down, I knew I, we had to expect that people would leak it and it would get out in the community and cause all sorts of problems so we were ready for it. But you know, William, in, two, in the two year period, nobody talked about it. I asked employees not to. I said, this is our business, we're a family, and they stuck by it. It was. Uh, <clears throat> so it was quite an exciting uh, experience in my life. So I, I uh, learned there, you know, the uh, power of the employee. If you, and uh, and if you particularly if you get them to think and act like an owner of the business, uh, you know, th they'll work with them. But you got to, yeah. But loyal. you got to respect what they can offer, and they they offered a lot. And and a lot of the reason we were so successful is because of ideas that came right from the shop floor. And, and that, and so we. I went from there, and I moved back to Toronto in uh, nineteen ninety. Where, where was the? I was in Vancouver refinery? and yeah. Coquitlam, okay. Port Moody Refinery, and um, and so in nineteen eighty four, I returned to uh, Imperial Oil, and uh, really, uh, the position uh, I became a division manager, which is a very senior position, and the and the only other positions higher in Imperial would be in Toronto. So we actually thought we would bought our last house, my wife and I, and by this time I had three little kids. And uh, uh, the only thing I had left to do was to go do a two-year assignment down in New York or Connecticut with our major shareholder, Exxon, get my, as we called it, our ticket punch. You know, the major shareholder always wanted to uh, know the individuals who are uh, reached the senior executive level and imperial, but the world changed. And if you remember, 1986, uh, Saudi Arabia they they opened the valves and flooded the market with crude oil. The crude price drove to less than ten dollars a barrel. You know, we think it's low at fifty five today. <laughs> uh, for, yeah, you know, all the time I was at Syncrude, it was a lot lower than that. So it went down below 10 and, and the world changed. And there was also, um, uh, it was understood the world was changing uh, from other ways because uh, one other interesting thing, I was given a job, they pulled me and Len Perez. Len uh, ultimately went on. One of his jobs was he uh, was headed up CPPI, you know, Canadian Development Product Institute. Uh, Len was a brilliant young 
Uh, we were both about 40 years old, division manager level, him from marketing, me from uh, refining. Uh, the president said, uh, took us out, said, I start with a blank sheet of paper and redesign the whole of Vessel Petroleum Canada, oh. all downstream, right? From values right on up. And they lent us, uh, we had a, we knew there'd be big uh, changes to the regional marketing. So they gave us, uh, uh, the manager, Jacques Bedard, who is a manager in Quebec, uh, work with us. Uh, we need to crank some numbers. So we had a, a controller who was about to retire, Ray McPhee, and they gave us part time organizational effective consultant and uh, so we redesigned uh, um, ESO Petroleum and, uh, and and changed the whole nature of the company. I won't go into a lot of that but uh, but what I did too in the process I designed away my own job. I didn't have a job at the end <laughs> and so I helped with the transition. We did a lot of uh, really innovative things to prevent uh, getting into a layoff situation. I. I have a strong aversion to layoffs, but in big organizations, I think you should try to work with the people you got, be flexible, and as long as they're flexible, look at different careers, you can do a lot. And I learned that initially at Imperial, and that we applied it in, in spades at uh, Syncrude. But, but uh, the, the upshot of redesigning the ESO Petroleum and designing away my job was, uh, and, and again, the world had changed, so we didn't have the big infrastructure within the Exxon. So this business about go get in your ticket stamped uh, was going to go by the wayside and um, and so I ended up being sent to Syncrude on loan in 1986. On loan. Yeah, How because does that work? well because Imperial Oil owned 25 percent of Syncrude. Syncrude's a big okay. uh, mega project, joint project. It's had, uh, it started with four owners uh, but it, I've seen it as many as 10 owners. It goes up and down and and the ownership structure uh, can change. But Imperial was one of the originals and has always been there, a big, big supporter of it. And uh, I uh, initially was there as Vice President of Finance and Men for a year. Uh, the v Vice President of Operation retired. I replaced him two years. I ran the operation for two years. And then the President and CEO re retired. And so I replaced him and became CEO of Syncrude in on August in August of, of 1989, and uh, it was at that point because I was still pretty young. Uh, you know, I would have been um, uh, I would have been 44, I guess, uh, and I was taken over as CEO of one of the largest corporations in Canada. And so I'd be there for some time, and uh, and so it wasn't my decision uh, totally because, as I said, Imperial Oil was so good to me as a uh, employer and. Uh, uh, but I resigned from Imperial, became a Syncrude employee, and uh, but the transition was smooth. And uh, where did you? Smooth. Uh, and we lived and we moved from Toronto uh, to F Fort McMurray. And when 1986, just an interesting side point to tell you how much I moved. When in 1986, Fort McMurray was my 15th city in 20 years. Oh, I lived wow. In. I was going to ask you what out of all your. Your career <laughs> traveling. Well, if you had to pick a favorite city, what, what would it be? Oh, there's or, or a couple. Yeah, a couple. Um, well, San Diego was a lovely place to live I think in. So too. Pr right in the early '70s, and uh, we lived right near uh, Torrey Pines Golf Course there. You know, near La Jolla, and uh, it, it's just beautiful the climate and everything. Uh, another one before I came, I I always loved London, England. I just fell in love with my year and a half there, uh, but but. Uh, but we lived seven years in Toronto and uh, lived a bit in Montreal and Vancouver all over. And uh, uh, what, uh, my wife was, uh, she grew up in New Jersey, but she, she almost became a nun. She lived a lot of her life in a convent, but uh, I always tell people that she made the decision not to become a nun before I got down to New Jersey. I was not running around convents looking for dates. You were, you were, the, bad, you were the bad influence. <laughs> yeah, no, I wasn't. But anyhow, she, Kathy, I've been blessed with my wife because she was always very flexible and we moved and uh, we always, wherever we moved into a community, we made the church uh, the center. She sang the choir and we get involved in, and initially I used to get involved in a lot of stuff that, well, when I started having little children, I'd get involved in things I could do with my kids. and and. As I, they got older and didn't want to have play with the old man all that much anymore, then I got involved with uh, lots of other not for profits. Uh, but um, but yeah, no. So that's that was really my story. We got there. We we're fifteenth city in twenty years. It was culture shock for my my kids because they thought of Toronto of any place was his home. But 
but you know, uh, everybody there in Fort Murray, there's about 35,000 people, but virtually um, all of them come from different places. The average age of this town was 22. Yeah. We had no grandparents. And, and so uh, people were from everywhere else, and so they were very welcoming. From out east. As yeah, well. a, lot, a lot of them, 25% of our employees were from, uh, from the Atlantic provinces. And, uh, and I can assure you, when your children move well, uh, you move well, and that, uh, that helped. And then uh, we went the other extreme. We lived 17 and a half years in Fort Murray, and we loved it. I raised our uh, family. Uh, Living in the north is probably not everybody's cup of tea, but if you like the outdoors and you like communities, everyone in the mining business knows that, uh, how great it can be to live in some of these small communities. So, so I uh, felt blessed to be there and uh, retired at the end of 2003 and came back to Edmonton and we've lived here ever since. Why Edmonton? Just well, uh, Edmonton, there was a few reasons. Uh, <laughs> Uh, one of which I beca had become very involved with the university. I chaired the Board of Governors. Uh, I was on the board from 1996 to 2003. When I retired and came down here, I, I uh, became Chancellor of the University from 2004 to 2008. So I had very strong ties that way because other, cause you're right, I, we, we never lived in Calgary or Edmonton. Mm -hmm. and Fort Murray was the only place in Alberta. It was strange for someone in the oil business. but. And I love Calgary too, so I don't want to sound like I chose Evan because it's better in Calgary, but uh, it was more familiar. And of course, uh, your children and uh, it's very important. And uh, two two of my children, my daughters live here, and and we were starting into the uh, grand uh, uh, grandchild uh, age, and now we have six of our nine grandchildren live within 10 minutes drive of us in Edmonton. Wow. So we're not leaving. And my other three grandchildren, just to complete the story, are in Chicago where my son worked. Uh, he went there as a computer engineer, is now a banker, working with Northern Trust. But Like, uh, your, like your father. Yeah, like my father. So the, the full cycle there. So so there you got it, my whole life story and, uh, or career story. Um, you clearly were, uh, were a leader for many parts of your life, but did you have, or when you were younger, or throughout your life, a mentor or someone that really, yeah, in your professional career that really kind of, yeah, I think I think I've been first of all I've been very blessed with uh, people in my life, the support I got, and uh, um, you know you start with your parents, and and my dad was one of twelve kids who went through depression, uh, couldn't get to through school. My mom was. Uh, uh, she was the most of her life in an orphanage and uh, had a very tough life. But uh, uh, to my parents, education was everything. And they they really um, worked with me and my two sisters to make sure we got a good education. And uh, and uh, and we strove to take advantage of that. So, you know, so that that's quite unusual because <laughs> usually if the parents haven't gone to university, for example, you it's harder to for young ones, but I was very lucky that say. So I don't feel like I was. Uh, we were poor or anything like that. We had a modest upbringing, but uh, my dad uh, and my mom instilled some very strong values about education, and also in my dad's case about how you treat people. And uh, and he always said it doesn't matter. He says technology is going to be so important, so in the world, it's really important that you think about that and all that, but he says it will never replace personal relationships. And I think that's true, it's proven true. So so that was probably a very valuable piece of advice instead of values. Uh, but in terms of where I go, uh, I always tell a funny story of uh, how to pick an engineering and, and that was a, a vet with my Uncle George who was an engineer and I thought I wanted to be a chartered accountant and, or a lawyer and he said, no, no, he says, tell me what subjects you like and what do you want out of life, don't tell me jobs. And when I said I like math and science and I like business and all that, he said I didn't have a choice. And I said, oh, good, which one is it? Uh, corporate law or, or a chartered accountant? He says, neither. He says it's engineering. And, and to make a long story short, that got me into engineering. So that was a pivotal point. But um, I, think, uh, I think the assignment I had after my, my uh, did my master's in Birmingham with my boss, Sir Frederick Warner, he, he was a... A different kind of guy. He just died a year ago, two years ago, I think, at the age of a hundred, and he was still teaching in university in his nineties. I mean, he, he, the guy. He also led the uh, 
investigation of the Big Piper Alpha disaster in the North Sea. He uh, he lit, what he was knight. One of the things he was knighted for was uh, spearheading the cleanup of the River Thames, where we worked with uh, fifteen different agencies or nine different government agencies over fifteen years and. Uh, he did, he was president of the British Chemical Engineers, and a lot of those things. And but he was so good as a first boss. He he would just throw you in and let you sink or swim in a way, but uh, but always with the backup. And he he always he tried to drill in me. He says Eric and 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 others. He uh, young people of my age. I was about twenty two at the time. I guess he said, don't look and do the same job everybody else has just done. Try to look at areas where there's you're working on the boundaries. And and he gave me t two really good examples. One that he was trying to get me interested in because he was so successful. In, in uh, Back in the 60s, 50s and 60s, uh, if you looked at engineering in the area of uh, environmental and that, the big engineering field was civil engineering, not chemical. But, but Sir Frederick saw the magic. Hey, wait a minute. Things like cleaning up the Thames, we use uh, uh, we developed uh, for the day. It was very sophisticated hydrodynamic model and kinetic model because a lot of chemical engineering principles could be used. And a lot of the improvement, the cleanup of the Thames was not through structures. It was relocating uh, sewage plant effluents to take advantage of the tidal mixing of the river or the or the power plants because you don't if you heat up the river, it's going to use up the biological oxygen. Uh, the uh, faster you know, and you're going to get into the anaerobic conditions, which cause all the stink around Westminster. And so they they did a lot of that. Then, then after that, you start getting into the structures and that. So he he and he developed a whole different approach on environmental here. We were actually working. We had clients that were on both sides, going into the regulatory process, both on the industry and on the uh, regulatory or environmental side. And he predicted that was going to happen in, in uh, very accurately, that would happen in North America. And so he said that would be a really good area. Take your chemical engineering plus your environmental background. And he was going to help me. He actually was going to set me up with a consultant he had in Cleveland, Ohio. But I, I came up with, but he got me thinking. And uh, there was a better one, and that was with Imperial Oil, where Again, uh, we were looking at process control computers for all the refineries. Well, that was traditionally electrical engineer's job. It was all lead lags and the fancy instrumentation. That, But the magic of process computer control is how do you apply it to the process to make the process more efficient? That's where you get the value out of it. And that's chemical engineering. So, so, that's, so that's why I always put Sir Frederick way up there. He got me to think Stop thinking, become outside a conventional. Yeah, get outside the box. And so that's why I, I was either going to go down the environmental path uh, or I was going to go down this process control computing. And I went the, the ladder. That got me into Imperial for seven years. And, but, you know, if you look at my career, so much of it has been back in the environment area. So it, it, so it's a, it was a great piece of mentorship about young people. Don't limit yourself. Don't get into a narrow box. And we now call it lifelong learning, uh, but you know uh, he was such a wonderful mentor, and and he gave you the responsibility. And if you made a mistake, he was there to back you up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I knew I'd uh, really blown it once because I came walking into his office. He's very British, you know, and he and he'd sent me out to some client, and I must have really blown it because his answer to it, well, you know, Eric is from the colonies. <laughs> As if that would explain everything. He was very much your British uh, yeah, gentleman. He, but, he was a knight. <laughs> yeah, he was a knight, yeah. So, you can't get more yeah, than that. Yeah, and so, you know, you go through your career, and uh, uh, there's, uh, uh, I've had a lot. Uh, the the fellow I replaced the CEO for St. Crude Ralph Shepard, uh, uh, you know, he was great for me and Jim Carter, and we were a very young executive team, and we owe a lot to Ralph and his guidance and leadership. So, so I've just been very blessed. Good, good. And um, looking back again, this could be any job. Were there any dysfunctional jobs or organizations that you worked with or had to work with? Oh, dysfunctional. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, that's a, 
Well, we well, we did, in a way. Maybe I'll turn that around because uh, I think one of the, uh, there's a few things that we want to talk about in terms of the oil sands that the broader in the in the industry. And one, one area was that we worked very hard at, and uh, we were quite uh, successful in the end. Although I will always say we made every mistake in the book, and that was our effort with the Aboriginal. Uh, people first on the employment side at Syncrude, you know, we we end up being the uh, at one point uh, w certain the largest or one of the largest industrial employers of uh, Aboriginal people in Canada, and, and uh, when we started in there, uh, uh, our first mistake I like to talk about our mistakes was uh, uh, we thought we were in a hiring program, and so as fast as we'd hire these young people, this was before I got there. This would be back in. 1978, 79, when, when, when uh, Syncrude, yeah, but Syncrude started up, so this predates my time at Syncrude, and and because uh, we thought we were in a hiring program, but it, it, as far as fast as we hire them, we'd have to fire them. And when you think about it, bringing uh, some young people in from a small northern community of 200, 250 people, and throwing them into a huge industrial complex like Syncrude is not exactly a formula for sex, whether they're Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal. And so the first lesson we learned is we, we had to get into a development program. So, okay, so, so sorry, you were saying as fast as you hired them, you had to fire, fire them, them because... Well, they just couldn't adapt to okay, the, yeah. to the environment. And, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a very different environment for them and, uh, and, uh, and it just, it just didn't, wasn't working. So we realized, well, we had to be into a development. It's not just the hiring. And uh, so uh, we uh, did a few things. One, we got a Native Affairs advisor that helped us look at the world through the eyes of the Aboriginal community. We worked with, we, uh, at Syncrude in the oil sands in Fort Murray, we worked with five First Nations and six Métis locals over a, uh, an area that's as far north as Fort Chippewine, about 200 kilometers to the north, and John V and Anzac in the south, uh, about the same distance south. And um, so, uh, we had a Native Affairs advisor try to help understand and work with the communities. We worked then directly with the chiefs. We got we need because you need role models sometimes. So we got the chiefs to, in in the early days. Uh, Sinker got them to handpick a few good role models and and we bring them into the workplace. So that way, you know, they would uh, do well, and then others would be able to come. Uh, and and we did uh, the other thing we did is we put all our supervisors through cross country cultural training. To get them to really look at the world differently, look at it through the eyes, and to, the, to this date, it's broadened at Syncrud. We put all the Syncrud puts all our managers through diversity training, uh, so that deals with all sorts of other issues, gender and and other ethnic things as well as Aboriginal. So it was we were probably leaders. Uh, you know, the company would be a leader in that area at the time, and that helped. But you know, I always come back that the absolute critical thing for us was the education. We had to get the education level up, and we did all sorts of innovative things. We created uh, the general worker program because today, and, and legitimately today, uh, you have to have a minimum of grade twelve to get on a job in the workplace and uh, work sites in the oil sands industry. And and that's right. But uh, in those days, we didn't have any Aboriginals grade twelve, so we take them on a general worker program, grade ten. We work with the college; they develop the grade 12 equivalency course, GED, which people forget started out as an Aboriginal program. It's now not, it's for everybody. Uh, and then the, the idea was that any, uh, anyone we brought in the workforce as a general worker, an Aboriginal, they, they, they had to get their GED and if they had good performance, good attendance, uh, you, know, uh, you know, not any problems, then we guaranteed them a job. And that's how we did that for some time until we started to get some critical mass, and then we, we kept on uh, over the years. Uh, one of the other areas, though, that uh, I think is not well as well understood as uh, it should be is, uh, is uh, what happened with Aboriginal-owned businesses. Um, when I got to Syncrude in 1986, or when I became CEO in uh, 1989, we did have some uh, Aboriginal business. It was about $3 million a year but believe me, William, it, they, it was a good business. It was a subsidy. They weren't, uh, one was with Good Fish and they were doing, washing our 
gloves and overalls and all that, and we could have got it done for half the cost with anyone else at the time. Good Fish ultimately became a great success story, but at that point it was not way in. And Jim Carter, who you've already interviewed, and he's very well known in the mining industry, and Jim and I worked very, very closely at all these types of issues. Uh, we said, you know, uh, we knew how entrepreneurial uh, uh, Aboriginal communities are because we had this uh, OCAR program where we used to, we still do it to this day. We fly employees in from Fort Chip in the summer to clean bitumen off the uh, uh, tailings ponds and that. And when they had zeroed in on an objective, it's amazing how successful they were. So we thought, why don't we try to, we should be doing a better job of capturing that uh, entrepreneurial talent. And so we started working on how do you create companies and, and we, without boring you with all the detail, we, we actually have people who help them write business plans and that. And we had uh, a number of really good Aboriginal entrepreneurs that deserve a huge amount of this credit too. And a couple of really notable ones are, one is David Tuckero and, uh -oh, I'll turn that off. <laughs> Uh, and David Tucker. David, uh, um, he, he was a young guy. We've known him. He grew up as First Nation Cree from Fort Chip. And even when he was going to school, he had a pizza business. So this guy was always an entrepreneur. He's a businessman. Yeah. And so he uh, somehow managed to buy out this company called Negan, which was an earth moving company that the, the band sort of co owned. And, and we worked with David to, to, to get it to be really competitive and start him small and growing. And David, uh, who, who's uh, been picked as one of Canada's top 40, under 40, he's just amazing. He created uh, what was became known as the Northeast Aboriginal Business Association, NABA. And that's like a junior chamber of commerce for Aboriginal businesses. And, and they would help other young Aboriginals form business. And they would work with the oil sands to create them. And, and, um, and uh, Doug Golosky was the other one. And Doug was... Uh, uh, he's a Métis Cree and, and located in Fort Murray and him and his wife Carol started with absolutely nothing. I think he owns nine companies now. He was just inducted in the Business Hall of Fame. Uh, but one of his big ones was Clearwater Welding and I can tell you he could compete for safety and productivity with any other uh, non-Aboriginal company that worked on our workplace. So, And Doug did a tremendous amount of training and development of of youth, all youth, but Aboriginal youth in particular. And he now took over running of uh, NABA, Northeast Aboriginal Business Association. So here we were, just to fast forward on the numbers, back in the early 90s, you know, virtually nothing. 20 years later, we got, I think they have over 200 members, NABA now, over 200 Aboriginal companies. Last year, they did $1.6 billion of business with oil sands companies in that. When Jim and I started, because we're anal and engineers, we had to have a target, we pulled a number, nobody was doing it. So we pulled a number out of the air and said, if we could ever get to $30 million a year, nobody would question our motives, you know, and uh, it was so over the top. And so right away, we were in it initially for the wrong reason, eh? We thought this was philanthropy. Uh -huh. Last year, Syncru did $186 million for the Aboriginal business we helped create. And the only reason you're doing that it's because you're getting very competitive supply and services. So it's very much a win-win. And, and I think that's one of the big lessons uh, and the big values that our industry, right across the country, you look at what Cameco's done, you look at uh, you know, what James Bay and other places like that. I mean, uh, you know, we have our problems with our Aboriginal community. You know, we still got a wait, long ways to go maybe, but you know, the mining industry just shines in some of the examples of how how we've uh, brought the education levels up, the standard of living, and, 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 and got them involved in the business. And we just got to keep going down that path. Um, how present or absent were women in your workplace? Yeah, w women at Sacred, uh, yeah, we, it was, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, it, this is a tough issue because it's definitely a male-dominated industry. And, and uh, you know, we had, uh, uh, we, we tried hard. We thought we were trying hard. We worked hard with the university. We always try to get women, at female engineers. We hire, try to get more women in non-traditional roles, like in the 
skilled trade. So I think we were well motivated uh, in in a number of areas. But you know, uh, today we've you know we've had some women reach vice president level, and we have some managers. But I would, to be honest, I don't think we quite got there. I think we had a bit of a glass ceiling, and we still have to manage that uh, closely, William. What what we did when I was there is. Uh, uh, for any position, we always wanted to pick the best person, uh, but we'd insist often that identify who would be the best female, even if not qualified, just so try to break through. Because we obviously, when you have that sort of ceiling, there's got to be some sort of systemic stuff going on. Now, so that so that's an admission that you know it didn't get as far as I wanted, and I'll take a lot of uh, flack for that. Uh, there were some good examples though, and and one I think you talked to Jim Carter about was the Bridges program. And uh, again, this comes back to, uh, we need to, in order uh, uh, to survive as an industry back in 80s, you know, 89, early, in the early 90s, we really had to uh, improve the safety, reliability, and also get the cost structure under control. And at Syncru, we actually took our workforce from over 4,700 down to uh, less than 3,300. And we did it without any layoffs. It's almost unheard of. It took several years, but uh, and we totally redesigned the way How did that work? we redesigned. Well, we had a lot of um, uh, we managed attrition. You know, uh, we had one. Uh, we finally had to have one big early retirement program in '94. It was, but uh, up until that, we managed attrition. We took some areas we thought were done better with uh, uh, outside contractors. We outsourced them. And then we redeployed uh, workers. We always redeployed, though. We didn't, didn't, didn't just jump to layoffs. I'm dead, dead set against layoffs uh, when you can get people to be flexible. So we, we had to get redesigned the way work was done. So we had to go to our employees and say, uh, and, and so how are you going to get people to redesign the work so you can get rid of employees? Well, the, the deal was this. I said, I can't guarantee you job security, but I can guarantee you employment security. But you have to be flexible and not just think of your own job, be prepared to do it. And if you do that, uh, you know, I can make you that guarantee, And I, but you know the business. You are the ones who have to redesign how it works on. So what I wanted to say, we didn't have 4,700 underutilized or lazy people that, that enabled us to get down to 3,250. We had to redesign the way work was done. The other issue we faced, and this was with getting back to the women mm -hmm. side, uh, was we knew where the job growth was. The job growth was going to be in mining equipment and that. As the mine got bigger, you need more trucks, you need more bumps and seats and, and that. And, uh, and as we expanded the thing, we're going to need more skilled tradespeople. We could see that coming. That demographic was happening already because young kids weren't coming into the trades and yet they were about to retire. So that was a great opportunity. Where the jobs are going to disappear so it was in the administrative areas because of computers and different ways of doing things. Where were our female employees? Well, to they're highly concentrated in the administrative areas. So, so we had a choice. Well, we could fire those people and go hire more uh, drivers of trucks and that. And we said, well, why would we do that? Why, why shoot good employees? So, again, Keanu used to always wonder what the hell would we come up with next. But in the Bridges program, we actually set them up. They had designed a two-week course where we took women uh, who are in administrative roles so all their lives go in and they because one of the big barriers of, of taking women from that kind of a role and putting them out into into a male dominated workplace is they don't know the jargon growing up even though i'm not very handy i knew what a con rod was or a piston whatever well if you don't know the jargon you, you got two strikes against you and so unless you're very extroverted you'll sink away so so we knew that so for two weeks they built bird cages and they learned all this stuff. Then we had a program where they would then job shadow. They could pick the career, and 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 finally go right to the point where they would. We'd let them work a 28-day work cycle with a team they would be part of, and um, all through that period, they at any point the woman could say, "I've had it. It's too big a change. I want my original job back." Back at the home front, the the job that was left vacant, they were not allowed to fill it. On, not even on a temporary basis. They had to redesign the work in there to backfill for that person. So that was also how we forced the uh, work redesign in the system. And by the way, there was none ever asked to go back. I was going to say most. You women. know, and 20, in the end, 25% of our drivers of the 410 trucks were women. 
And uh, when we got one of the Employer of the Year awards, McLean's phoned me up and uh, I made the point, you know, they're not all spring chickens, you know, these women. <laughs> in fact, my son-in-law's mother, at the age of 54, after spending her whole career in administrative roles, is now driving a 400-ton truck. And they said, oh, she could to interview well. Marie, they call her mother out at uh, site, or my son-in-law calls her Hitler. But uh, she's an outgoing Irish woman, and, and the whole article was about Marie and her truck. <laughs> and, and she was great, but uh, you know, I, even to this day, her and I will go into grade four classes and five classes and talk to the kids about what it's like. And they, they want to talk to her more than they want to talk to me. They want to know, what's it like to drive that truck, yeah. big truck that's the size of a 747 plane? Yeah. So, so yeah, so on the women's side, <clears throat> you know, some big challenges, uh, still working, it's a great area. And was there any, what, if, let's say with the, that, the bridge program, was there any adversity met with the guys on the, in the fields? <clears throat> well, we had, uh, uh, well, you, we have, um, uh, the whole issue of diversity is alive and well there because, uh, first of all, uh, the oil sands being up north, it wasn't, we hired from all over the world. So in many respects, it's a very multicultural community. And, and that's good in the, in the education level. So in many respects, it's a model. But you do run into that, William. And, and that's why I, uh, I mentioned our uh, cross-cultural training, which started off just as Aboriginal. Today is diversity-wide. We need to be open to, we're all different individuals, first of all. That's the biggest difference. But uh, you know, we, we need to respect those differences and make sure everybody uh, can sort of reach their full potential in the work environment. That's the ideal. And, it, and the day you get there is the day you don't need any special programs. It's just the way you work. And so, so I'd have to say, probably not quite there yet, but yeah, those, those, those areas. Yeah. And uh, within, again, you've worked in many different jobs, but uh, within, throughout your career, uh, were there any social uh, problems like um, uh, alcoholism or drug use or things like that that were <clears throat> kind of a trend in, in certain jobs or certain uh, yeah. branches uh, of jobs? Yeah, so, well, substance abuse it was always a big issue. At the, It is a big issue at the oil sands uh, areas and uh, it's something you have to manage. Uh, I'm not trying to say it's any... <laughs> necessarily any worse, but you are up north and, uh, you know, and people have got good money and uh, uh, those issues uh, happen and, and you just have to be prepared to manage it and uh, and we had to hit it, hit it head on and, uh, and so initially uh, we had static, but for example, anytime there's uh, an incident, immediately there's uh, some, there'll be some drug testing and all that and then you know, so there's any reason, but uh, we uh, uh, we have it. Uh, uh, some companies have actually gone to random testing in critical jobs. Uh, uh, I'm not sure whether Syncrude's there today. They we didn't get there during my time. We always uh, felt we didn't that that wasn't necessary to go that step. But we did do a lot of training with our supervisors and how to deal with it, and and maybe how not to deal with it when it was. A problem. It was need to bring in the medical people and uh, and that. So yeah, it's a uh, that and the other area that was uh, that you need to really manage uh, uh, carefully and differently is uh, long term disabilities because uh, when people go on long term disabilities, a uh, uh, manager with who's got control of a tight budget and that is not very going to be very uh, open to bringing back someone who can't is not fully productive and yet doctors and that will tell you the best thing you can do is get people back in some form into the into the workplace so atrophy doesn't take place and it may not be where they normally would work and so we used to manage that we had a, a team of general manager levels and, and and they would have to take all the long-term disability cases and we would find out what was the best thing to do so I think Syncrude was actually a uh, excelled in that area. Yeah. Do you want to talk about the National Oil Sense Task Force? Sure. Yeah. Um, the other, the, the other thing that happened uh, in coming to, um, uh, th there was a period of time where the oil sands was really on everybody's radar screen. You know, we had Suncor Greek Canadian oil sands started up in '67. Then in 1978, Syncor came along and started up. But then we went through a long period where we had all these mega projects. They kept 
coming up, but the, nothing got built. You know, they go on the shelf. And, uh, and we had, and the reason for that is we had this mega project mentality. And I would say both governments and uh, industry had this mega project mentality. And by that, I mean, we thought, the because the financial risks in that were so great with these things. They're huge projects relative to anything else. And, uh, and uh, you know, the, the economics were, uh, you know, tight, you know, high cost and uh, of getting the oil extracted and that. So we all thought that you had to have special royalty terms or, or uh, tax terms, you know, uh, uh, or handouts, government participation or whatever. And, and, so, and, and so that's often why it would fail. And uh, as we moved out in time, we got to 1986, so we went through, uh, the, we had the fall collapse of the crude oil prices, and that created a new era where we had a really sharpener pencil. And we had to become more and more inward focused, which we did at Syncrude and Suncor and Esso down at Cold Lake. We were the three big operators. And we really zeroed in on how to make the operation more reliable, how to get the cost structure in control. That's when we got onto all this work redesign and everything. So we get the costs down. Because what people forget is all through the 90s, even after 86, all through the 90s, the price never was 21 to $25 a barrel. It wasn't even going up with inflation. And inflation was riding at 4% a year. Because I remember our thing was, it was we had offset inflation for about 4% a year in our cost structure every year. And we got half of it by increasing production and getting the divisor effect, cost per barrel. Uh, by if you put more barrels through, the cost doesn't necessarily go up. So that was one big. But the other thing was an efficiency, like workforce redesign and 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 uh, other other efficiencies. Uh, so so in that period, while we we're so focused, people forgot about the oil sands. And then we had these mega projects that people were trying to develop, but they they started to fail because governments, if you all recall, all of a sudden we realized we can't be running with big deficits. In 1993, Ralph Klein came in on that, you know, eliminated the deficit in Alberta, but it was already happening in the federal government level. And, and so there was no way the industry was going to get handouts. So um, we were talking about the Alberta Chamber of Resources, which is a, a great industry association. It's, uh, it's made up of all the resource indust industries in Alberta, and uh, it does some incredible stuff. So we were talking about this one day and we said, you know, without really knowing what we were talking about, we said, we got to create a National Oil Sands Task Force. We got to get oil sands development going again. Everybody's forgotten about it. And, and the reason is because nobody, you know, there's going to be no handouts. So we got to figure out a way to do this that doesn't require handouts. But we need to engage all the players, government, industry, um, uh, technology providers, academia, environmentalists, if we could, aboriginals, you know. So, so we uh, had to create this thing. So uh, it's a little known fact, but we actually worked with George Miller, who was the executive director of the Mining Association of Canada, and Syncrude had a very good relationship in there, especially through Dennis Love, who was head of our mining at the time. And so we, we inserted in his report, because as a provincial association, we could not get on the energy mines and ministers meeting that was occurring that uh, it was 1991, September 24th, it was in Halifax. And, uh, but the Mining Association, as the national organization, did get on there. So we put in there that we, uh, recommendation that we form, create a National Oil Sands Task Force. And, and it got passed. But unfortunately, the conservatives were in at that time, and Jake Epp was the energy minister. And I always admired Jake, because the easiest thing for a politician is just, well, yeah, we'll just take another study and, uh, you know, push it off the side, you know, put it on the back burner and you don't get flat. Uh, but, his, but his folks that were there didn't understand what we were suggesting. They, they came back and said, Jake, watch out, here comes the oil sands guys again with their hand out. They're going to be coming after you for a big hand out. Well, it was absolutely not the case. And through, I got a lot of help from Jack Shields, our MP, working with Jake. I finally, over a lapse time of uh, two years, and uh, probably about three meetings with Jake, I, I convinced him that that's not what we were trying to do. We wanted to create the National Oil Sands Task Force to avoid the fact, uh, you know, of, of governments having to come in and, and do them. Because two things had happened. One, 
one is no, there was no investment coming into the oil sand because uh, the, you know that that soft item called investor confidence a very loose loosely understood thing but you definitely know when you got it and you know when you don't we had no money coming in and i'm convinced it was because investors they understand they're willing to accept risks of market like crude price things like that but they don't think the fiscal term should be at risk or the regulatory thing and here we were doing you went in and negotiated them on a project by project basis and we know the governments are not dummies they they would ratchet out any upside so Capital by this time was starting to move around the globe as easy as sitting at your PC. So it's going to go where it gets the best treatment. And it wasn't the oil sand. So that we didn't have that. The other part was, uh, as I said, the governments, they couldn't afford the handouts and all that. So, uh, you know, because they were trying to solve their fiscal challenges. So, so we created this task force. We call it the mother of all collaboratives because I think we had 70 uh, 70 people, about 35 organizations were involved in this thing. And uh, we, had, we identified, uh, first of all, a very exciting vision using technology, how we could uh, develop this ro uh, resource. We could triple the production, you know, but it would take us, uh, because we came out with the report at the middle of uh, 1995, it took us two years to develop this vision for Canada for the oil sands and energy and and we identified, but here are the barriers that we overcome, and we had about eight areas, and we had task force for them. And so we came out, but we, one of the things we did right about that task force in the chamber was uh, instead of talking about how we're going to make Imperial Oil more profitable or Shell, people really don't care about that, but they care about jobs, they care about uh, tax and royalty revenues to governments that you know, enable the social programs that we value so highly as Canadians. So that's how we dimension it. We got everyone turned on and we said the vision is, that, and we had some substance to this, was we could triple production, but it'd probably take us 25 years and it would cost 21 to $25 billion. And I, <laughs> I used to get the cold sweat saying that, well, you know, cause at that time nothing was going in and it sounded so grandiose, but, uh, but we did, we captured the imagination. We, uh, um, we uh, came up with a fiscal regime, for example, uh, uh, that quite simply we formed a task force with uh, Natural Resources Canada, F Finance Canada, Alberta uh, Energy, Alberta Finance, uh, the industry, and um, we said we got to come up with a regime that does a better job of sharing the upfront risk in return for a fair share of wealth on, on payback, you know, to the government, okay? It's simple, that was language. Well, uh, once you get people galvanized on the vision and the, what's potential, it was amazing how fast the barriers fell. By the, that report came out May of 1995. By November, Ralph Klein, the Premier of Alberta, announced the generic royalty regime. That really was the major thing. And, and the following fall, by now the Liberals are in, and Paul Martin, and we had a lot of help from Ann McClellan, she's my hero in the federal government uh, when she was Minister of Natural Resources Canada and Paul's my hero on the finance side. They came through in the March of 1996 with the tax changes to it. And so once you set the environment right, so what happened? Well, it proved we weren't very visionary because instead of it taking uh, 25 years, we tripled production in eight years. It's now five times the production level. We didn't, um, it, we didn't spend 21 to 25 billion today uh, since then, uh, 140 billion has been invested in projects that have been completed or are underway or planned in the oil sands, become one of the biggest success stories in Canadian history. And uh, it all started because, uh, you know, we, we had to try to figure out how to get it going and not live off government handouts. We had to kill that mega project mentality and really band together. So here we are. Looking ahead now, uh, I always say it's technology that got us to where we are today, but it's going to be technology that's got to take us to where we need to go to tomorrow. So where do we need to go tomorrow? Well, the big challenge is facing Canada right today. First of all, there's a huge world energy demand out there. The IEA, 35% growth in energy demand by 2030. But whether we like it or not, it's going to depend on fossil fuels we, for decades to come. So we're blessed with these great resources. 
but it won't just happen. We have to, if we're going to develop that, the oil sands to its full potential to meet rising world energy demand and to get the tremendous, there's tremendous socioeconomic benefits to this country from it. But we have to do it in a sustainable fashion. So the challenges we now have facing us are uh, environmental in nature. And I'm currently chairing uh, the Canadian Council Academy's uh, expert panel on technological prospects to reduce the environmental footprint of oil sands development. But I can tell you this, the big issues are, we got a, a globe, the big global issue is how can we reduce our greenhouse gases so that Canada and Alberta can meet its climate change targets. Climate change is a big issue, it's with us today. If we don't live up to it, it's not that we're gonna destroy the planet, but uh, we won't have the credibility and they'll find ways to stop us. And look at whether it's pipeline approvals, whether it's low carbon fuel standards, they'll find a way. So the global, uh, so the global greenhouse gas emissions globally. And the biggest issue regionally and locally are the whole issue around, um, it's the mining side of the game, it's the tailings ponds, uh, how to get to a drier landscape faster, how to treat water, return it to the environment, how to reclaim the land more quickly. So I'm very bullish. Uh, I know if we get people all working together, uh, we'll solve those challenges. And so I think Canada uh, is a, a wonderful, uh, it's got a wonderful future in oil sands and, and in other resources. We're a resource-based economy. We should never be ashamed of that. The CIM is a tremendous leader for us. They should be proud of uh, all the leadership they've provided over the years. And, uh, and there are many stories, such as the ones I've told, that uh, uh, I hope you can get out there because it's such a valuable exercise. If we don't, if we don't do the, such things as this oral history, we'll lose all that. It's not that we'll lose the facts or the, the numbers, but what we'll lose is the stories that went behind uh, the incredible success that our industry's the had. Best part of history. Best part yeah, of history, yeah. Those stories. Well, uh, I know we're running short, so we'll, just a last question uh, for you. I thought you could probably pick some of that out for your 30-minute clip. 30-second uh, clip, yeah, come sure. in for the... Yeah, for sure, but uh, um, maybe I'll we'll yeah. just do a little one at the end. Okay. Yeah. I'll stop and start it just so it's yeah. easy edit. Um, but last question, official question before that. Uh, if you had to speak to uh, someone younger, like me, or yeah. children, or, or students... What's the most important uh, lesson or life lesson you could you could tell them? Uh, my most important thing for children is uh, try to find out what you're passionate about. Don't worry about what the job title is. Find out where your passion lies, what, what really interests you, and then from there try to pick your, develop your career path along the way. And, and I've heard the saying, if you, if, if you end up working, if you end up uh, doing what you're passionate about, you'll never have to work a day in your life. Yes. You know? true. But it's true. Yeah, I, I form Careers the Next Generation, and we work with kids all over the province, and, and that's what we're doing, and we run workshops. We put 40, over 40,000 a year kids through career workshops in the classroom, but we also run workshops at night for parents. You know, we're in, last year we were in 514 high schools, 300 and two communities and and we we mess we're getting out there is hey look don't don't try to tell your kid where to go or especially this I'm not anti university but you know you, you know we say you know it's uh, not not every job requires a university education uh, some do and we're not against universities but every job requires to get a good education so listen to your teacher stay in school and and why don't you come out and we'll try to get you uh, and we're trying to get kids into the skilled trades and, and the other generic area we work in is health services. We develop 200 career pathways in health. And, and so we create internships where kids, uh, while well, they're in grade 11 and 12, they can actually get out in the workplace and test drive a career. And, and they find out whether they like it or they don't like it. And it's, uh, and it, it's really, really good because this, uh, once they find out what they're passionate in and get in, the, the stories we've got from them are tremendous. Well, thank you very much for the, okay. for the interview. Yeah.
Hello, my, my name is Eric Newell. I'm the former uh, CEO and chair of the board of Syncrude uh, Canada Limited and uh, Chancellor Emeritus at the University of Alberta. Uh, I'd just like to talk to you briefly about the importance of the CIM's legacy project. This is where the CIM is going to interview a number of uh, people of a long history in our industry and, and develop an oral history. and. Uh, you know, it's so important that we not lose the stories. We can always uh, sort of track down numbers, but, uh, you know, Canada's got a tremendous uh, resources, natural resources industry, and uh, and there's so many good stories that need to be told. Uh, uh, this, this legacy project is very important. I would encourage anyone who gets the opportunity to tell some of their stories, uh, don't, don't be bashful, step up. Uh, we need to, we got to be proud of uh, our resource-based economy and what's been uh, achieved over the last uh, almost 150 years now as uh, Canadians in uh, uh, the resources industries.